welcome everyone attending to the pathology, laboratory medicine pathology pathology component of pathology grand rounds. Um, today we're going to learn about uh, T cell lymphomas, that uh, relatively rare cancer um, from uh, the director of our Durham Path Division, Dr. Michi Chinohara. And briefly, she is uh, uh, from the Northwest, from Oregon, Reed College, then a couple of research years in uh, Oregon, and then basically University of Washington based, except for her Durham Path Fellowship, which she did at the University of Pennsylvania. So um, she now is Associate Professor of um, Laboratory, well, Joint Appointment, I guess, Laboratory of Medicine, Pathology, and Dermatology, Director of Durham Path in our department, Associate Chief of Dermatology, and Director of the uh, Durham Path Fellowship Program. So Mishi, please help elucidate cutaneous T-cell lymphomas for us. We look forward to it. Thank you, thank you. And um, thank you everybody for coming and to those who are gonna watch later. Thank you and welcome. Um, yeah, and one only correction to my introduction is I'm actually from Alaska. And I, oh. I only say that because people sometimes hear there and they're like, you're from Alaska. It's just such a distinctive thing about my um, past. So yeah, I was born and raised in Alaska and went to Oregon for college. Well, thank um, you. <laughs> yeah, um, so it's, it's uh, I, but I am a true Northwest person, mostly North with because of Far that. Northwest. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, far North. Um, so uh, today we're gonna talk about cutaneous T cell lymphoma. Uh, and the context for this is that I also do clinical work as a dermatologist in the space of cutaneous lymphoma. I have a multidisciplinary clinic at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance alongside with an oncologist, Andre Shustoff, and we see um, a fairly high volume of patients um, because we're the only center um, in the whole Northwest region until you get down to Stanford. So we have a pretty robust service. And I do have some minor disclosures that I um, uh, participate in some clinical trials, but none of them are gonna be relevant for this talk. So our learning objectives for today, I wanna really make it so that everybody can converse about why diagnosing CTCL is so challenging. I think people already probably have some ideas about why that is, but I'll lay out some of my thoughts. I wanna summarize some of the latest in diagnostic and prognostic techniques for diagnosing cutaneous T-cell lymphoma and update some current understanding of the molecular landscape of CTCL, which really is starting to nicely tie together with some clinical observations that we're making. And I'll try to do that. So basic stats about cutaneous lymphoma. We know they're all classified as non-Hodgkin lymphomas by the World Health Organization. The skin is the number two most common site of involvement by extranodal non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, so skin is a very active immune organ. The overall incidence of cutaneous lymphomas are rare, about one in 100,000, um, including uh, T and B cell lymphomas, but in general, T cell lymphomas are much, much more common than B cell lymphomas, which is why we're focusing on them today. And um, just a little bit about what, I, what am I talking about when I'm talking about cutaneous T cell lymphoma? I am a huge lumper. And so I will say this term a lot, CTCL and cutaneous lymphoma, most of the time I'm really talking about mycosis fungoides or MF and Cesare syndrome. And that is because those two diagnoses make up the bulk of what we see in clinic, mycosis fungoides and Cesare. You will see that on this uh, bar of incidence um, from the EORTC, anaplastic large cell lymphoma and lymphomatoid papulosis are also a pretty big chunk. I will say the majority of those patients are actually patients with lymphomatoid papulosis, which is really debatable about whether it's a cutaneous lymphoma or not. It does not behave like a lymphoma. It doesn't kill anybody. So um, if you took that off of this bar graph, MF uh, would you know, really encompass most of this. But there are all these other subtypes on here. But basically when I say CTCL, most of the time I'm talking about MF and Cesare, mostly. Um, but there are also all these other subtypes of CTCL. There are those non mycosis fungoides CTCLs, including some indolent variants and a few aggressive ones. We're not going to talk about any of those today. Just know that they're out there. Our main role is to help with diagnosis, excluding these subtypes. So um, caveat, I'm not an immunologist, but I've had to learn a lot about immunology and caring for these patients. 
and in helping to diagnose them um, in the derm path service. And um, T cells in the skin are really important. Um, there are a really high volume of T cells in normal human skin that contains about 1 million T cells um, per uh, centimeter squared, which uh, ends up being around 20 billion T cells uh, in the normal adult sized human. That's about twice the number of T cells in the blood. So the, the skin is a very T cell rich organ. Um, which is why probably T cell lymphomas are so much more predominant. Um, about 80% of the T cells in the skin are effector memory type. And uh, we refer to those as skin homing because they really have a preference for the skin. They're found mostly in either the blood or the skin, mostly in the blood, 90%, sorry, my 90% of them stay in the skin and they can circulate and come in and out through the blood, but most of them live in the skin. Um, there are also, T central memory T cells, um, a little small population in the skin that can migrate to the blood and the lymph nodes, but they're a very small population. But it's relevant and I'm telling you about them because there's some new thinking about Cesare syndrome and mycosis fungoides, which suggests that mycosis fungoides is a disease of these skin homing T effector memory T cells, whereas Cesare syndrome is likely a disease of these uh, T central memory T cells. And then there's T regs and TH17 cells. We're not going to talk about those at all because we're not talking about psoriasis today. Mycosis fungoides is um, really an awful name. <laughs> I mean, it means fungus, fungus. And uh, this disease is not a fungus at all. Uh, nonetheless, the name has historically stuck. Um, and clinically, um, patients. Um, when this was first named, would present with large fungating tumors. And I think that is the reason for the, the mushroom-like growths on the skin. That's the reason for the name, but it's really kind of awful. And as I mentioned, it's likely a disease of skin resident memory T cells. And that's based on some really like sophisticated work out of the Harvard system uh, by Thomas Cupper and Rachel Clark. Uh, highly recommend their work. And just some clinical pictures. Um, this is an image of typical mycosis fungoides uh, with um, uh, patches, some thin plaques that are pretty nondescript to be honest, kind of eczema-like, sometimes psoriasis-like, usually in the double covered area. This is showing buttocks because that's the most frequently involved area of the skin. Here's somebody with slightly darker skin tone showing that there's often some variability in skin pigmentation that accompanies um, MF, especially early lesions. And then as disease becomes more advanced, you could start to see more thick plaques, tumors. And this is the classic mycosis fungoides uh, of the name with large fungating tumors. Uh, Cesare syndrome, in contrast, we know as the leukemic variant of, my, of cutaneous T cell lymphoma and class, clinically is described as a triad of erythroderma, which is defined as uh, erythema, redness of the skin, encompassing at least 80% of the body surface area, circulating cesare cells. Here's an example of a smear showing a cesare cell with those crenulated nuclei and lymphadenopathy. Uh, by definition is this uh, cesare syndrome. And as I mentioned earlier, cesare syndrome is really thought to be a distinct disease from mycosis fungoides because it likely arises from a different type of T cell. Uh, from these lymph node homing central memory T cells. And uh, we see that clinically, how patients don't generally have mycosis fungoides for a long time and then progress to Cesare syndrome. They usually start out with erythroderma when they have Cesare syndrome. So that explains some of our clinical observations. Here's a clinical example of Cesare syndrome showing erythroderma. Um, the, the erythema and erythroderma can be really variable from really kind of light almost sunburn-like to very thick, like kenified um, as, and scaly as in this patient. And um, one thing to know about Cesare syndrome is that there is an extremely high, as John Oler used to say, misery factor. Patients are extremely itchy. It's very common that patients come in and you ask them, what's your itching from one to 10? And they're like, 11, it's always 11. It's really extremely um, morbid and symptomatic disease and um, can present also with keratoderma or involvement of the hands and feet. This can make it hard for people to walk or to use their hands. 
um, in any meaningful way, and then um, does frequently involve the face. And a classic finding is this ectropion or turned out eyelids from involvement around the eyes. So that's Cesare syndrome. And of course, this is a pathology talk. I'm gonna just talk a little bit about um, the pathology of mycosis fungoides. There's kind of two uh, classic uh, reaction patterns that we see in mycosis fungoides, uh, a lichenoid and a kind of psoriasiform slash chronic spongiotic. Um, we don't usually consider a spongiotic dermatitis um, to be a MF pattern because technically you're not supposed to have a lot of spongiosis in mycosis fungoides. That's one of the uh, things that might argue against it. But most cases of MF fall into one of these two for early disease at any rate. Uh, the abnormal T cells in mycosis fungoides classically do this uh, thing called epidermotropism where they're obviously tropic for the epidermis. And once there, um, they frequently form potria microabscesses, which is defined as a collection of three or more of these atypical T cells. Um, you'll notice in this image that many of those look pretty big. Um, and I will argue that probably some of them are also longer Hans cells. That's very frequent for them to cluster together with the atypical T cells in mycosis fungoides. Here's a closer up look. I think there's probably several longer Hans cells mixed in there, but this shows you nicely um, these atypical T cells here with sort of crenulated nuclei, raisin like. And here's another just high power view of. Um, of some of that morphology for these MF cells. I'll say you don't have to have really great morphology for MF in order to have it be MF. Um, so uh, relying on the uh, morphology alone um, can be a little misleading. Um, another helpful factor in diagnosing MF is this concept of epidermal dermal discordance. Because that atypia can be pretty subtle or minimal, it's often helpful to look at overall in the epidermis, what are the size of the lymphocytes in there and how do they compare to the dermal ones? You can see in this example, they're a little more abnormal. So it's a little easier to see what some of these reactive T cells are quite a bit smaller. And that can be, that can be helpful when you have sort of not a high degree of atypia as well. Uh, wiry collagen is often found. That's papillary fibroplasia, same thing. That's really just, um, pointing to the chronicity of mycosis fungoides for most patients. You can see this in other chronic dermatoses, so it's absolutely not specific, but often present. And then that kind of subtle variant of epidermotropism is this tagging along the dermal epidermal junction. This is a really nice example of it, just showing these cells kind of lining up um, along the basal membrane there, DEJ tagging. And then really another variant on epidermotropism, epithelial tropism is uh, follicular tropism where there's involvement of the hair follicles. This is a pretty florid example with tons of atypical T cells involving the hair follicles. Just to show you an image of more advanced stage mycosis fungoides, uh, very frequent to have in tumors and thick plaques, um, deeper dermal, even subcutaneous involvement and uh, often you will lose some of that epidermotropism. You don't have to, but often you do. About 10 to 20% of patients with MF will progress to tumor stage and characterized clinically by you know, lumps or tumors. And um, a proportion of them will demonstrate large cell transformation, uh, which is a histologic definition. It's not a clinical one because there, you could have somebody with tumors who does not have large cell transformation. So it's defined as having at least 25% of the large cell of, of the dermal infiltrate being three times the size of normal lymphocytes. So enlarged ones, and they may or may not be CD30 positive, which I'll show you uh, an image of. But the typical immunophenotype of mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome is of um, uh, an infiltrate that retains pan T cell markers like CD3 and CD2 is predominantly CD4 positive and has a loss of CD7, sometimes CD5, and a loss of CD8. Um, interpreting these stains, this is a really nice clean example. Interpreting these stains, as anyone who sat on the Derm Path Service knows, is very challenging because there are a lot of longer Hunt cells and other dendritic cells in the epidermis, which stain with CD4. And so 
having this sort of elevated ratio can be challenging. Also, there are really any combination of other immunophenotypes in otherwise very typical clinically presenting MF. So you can have CD4 negative, CD8 predominant, you can have CD4, CD8 negative, you can have both positive, a um, lot of different variants. And they can all clinically look just like regular MF. And then this is an example of large cell transform CD30 positive MF, just showing you that CD30 can be strongly expressed in that variant, but is not in all. Cesare under the microscope, see mycosis fungoides, because essentially Cesare syndrome, when it's diagnosable on skin biopsy, looks like mycosis fungoides. There's nothing in there, a skin biopsy, that would point towards Cesare. Really important point is that only 30% or about a third of cases uh, of patients with Cesare can be diagnosed by skin biopsy alone. And that um, is really just important for us to reinforce back to clinicians. If someone is suspecting that, then they absolutely have to get flow cytometry of the blood. You can't diagnose it off a of skin biopsy if it's not there. Um, and we have, I've seen that multitude of times clinically. Um, there is a staging system for mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome that is completely unique to those two diseases. Um, the other CTCLs either don't have a staging system or they're kind of lumped together in their own. And um, you'll see it's based on the similar TNMB um, framework, but T in this instance really highlights the extent of skin involvement. So having uh, greater than or less than 10% of your body surface area involved with your mycosis fungoides or your Cesare syndrome um, helps, and whether you have tumors or not, helps uh, put you on the T system. And um, there are really a, only a few events that significantly upstage people. This is um, where you would go from there. The first one is tumors. So having tumors upstages people to stage 2B. Erythroderma places people at stage four. Having blood involvement, also stage four, uh, although you can have some minor blood involvement at stage three, and then nodal involvement, again, stage four. And um, this data is pretty old now. This is from 2003, but it's still really the best data that we have, and I quote this to patients all the time. Um, this is dis dis um, data from Stanford of their cohort of over 500 patients with MF and Cesare syndrome where they just looked at what has happened to patients over time with their disease. And a few things to note just off the bat, the y-axis here is in years. And so this goes out 30 plus years. And many of these curves are quite flat. Um, the uh, next thing to notice is that the majority of their patients um, have early disease. So about 55% if you add those two groups together have early disease defined as stage one or one, one A or one B that's patches or plaques. Um, and that their curves are quite flat, especially stage 1A. So most of these patients do really well. Um, so we divide based on this data patients into early and advanced stage. And essentially what you can say is that when patients have erythroderma or tumors, they're gonna be in more advanced. If they have other things, patches, plaques, they're likely gonna do pretty well. And so we agonize a lot over diagnosing early disease and you'll see, I'll get into that in a minute. But um, from the clinical side, the reality is these patients are probably gonna do fine whether it's mycosis fungoides or not. And so, you know, don't beat yourself up too much. <laughs> That's the point of that. So why is it so hard to diagnose CTCL? The first thing from a clinical standpoint is that there is an incredible amount of mimicry. Um, uh, MF is not the new syphilis because they're both pretty old diseases, but you could, you could correlate them a little bit because MF could be mistaken for a lot of different things. Psoriasis is a classic one, um, pityriasis, rubra pilaris, seborrheic dermatitis, pigmented purpuric dermatitis. Those are all things, these are all patients with MF that were um, diagnosed with other disorders. Um, and then the flip side can be true too, that patients can have not have MF, but have histologic bio, uh, findings that are concerning for CTCL. And these are two that I encountered in my clinic that are my personal favorites. This one was uh, a patient who had demodex folliculitis. So just, you know, inflamed hair follicles related to our mites. And this patient had a jellyfish sting um, that he developed a pseudolymphoma too. 
this patient had a fixed drug eruption that was, uh, I think, to ibuprofen. He was diagnosed as MF, but when we saw him, the history was not good. So um, one of the reasons that it's so difficult to diagnose early MF really comes down to uh, understanding the evolution of MF and what happens early on in disease. And I like this model of it. This is um, uh, what we're looking at is a you know, drawing of the skin. And in this, in this drawing, the red cells are the malignant T cells and the green ones are our reactive CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells, our anti-tumor T cells, basically like our good guys that are in there helping. And early on in disease, in patch disease or thin plaques, you have sometimes an equal amount of these cells, sometimes more of your reactive T cells. So when you take biopsies, you're trying to really suss out a very small population of abnormal cells. Of course, as you progress to thick plaques tumors, the proportion of tumor cells becomes more obvious. It's much easier to diagnose, but that's not where the diagnostic challenge is. It's with early disease. So in order to address this, there have been several algorithms proposed about how we might you know, be more um, systematic about diagnosing MF. One of them is by Joan Goutart at Northwestern. He proposed, these are for histologic criteria, looking at the density of the infiltrate, whether there are potri and microabscesses, what the cytologic atypia is. Um, in clinical practice, this is not undertaken widespread use, but people do still rely on it for studies of MF. And you get MF if you have seven points. Um, the, in terms of diagnosing clinically, the International Society for Cutaneous Lymphomas proposed this algorithm, which you'll see is really heavily weighted towards the clinical uh, presentation and towards just routine h &E findings. Basically, you get MF if you have four points in this, and um, the molecular studies and immunoprofile only get you one point each. So it's very weighted towards the clinical and just routine h and &E. And um, several of our trainees, myself, Dr. Chang, uh, Kate May in the lower left, uh, who is one of our former DermPath fellows, and then Dr. Ruba Heavy, who is a current um, APCP resident, but our last year's DermPath fellow, um, did a study looking at, well, do clinical photographs help with this um, difficulty in diagnosing? understanding that there is such a potential impact of the clinical presentation. And we found that when you present people photos of MF or of distractor disorders, that people's accuracy in diagnosing MF or not MF went from 77 to 83%, and that the inter-rater reliability went from really bad to a little bit less bad, but still bad, <laughs> sorry to say, it's just poor in general. And this um, applied to both pathology trained and dermatology trained dermatopathologist as well as a hematopathologist. So photos probably help. And it definitely made everybody more confident in whatever their diagnosis was, right or wrong. So CTCL. And of course, we all know about T cell gene rearrangement studies using PCR. My internet connection is unstable. Apologies if I start to get fuzzy here. Um, high throughput sequencing and flow cytometry. I'm not going to talk too much about flow, but we'll talk about the first two. And um, one problem with using T cell clonality studies really goes back to that um, diagram of what MF can look like in early disease which we know we have a very low population of atypical T cells in there. And often our studies will reflect that when we try to do clonality, that early MF um, can be negative by T cell clonality studies, or it can be oligoclonal, it's another common finding. And it may take doing several studies over years to really nail down that clone. And that was reflected in this study out of Stanford that showed that when uh, you take at least uh, two or more biopsies from different skin sites that you can really increase the specificity for diagnosing MF. So it took, it really improved that. And um, if you can show the same clone in two different compartments like skin and blood or skin and lymph node, that helps even more. So that is why you may see 
uh, dermatologists, you know, giving four biopsies for this diagnosis, just trying to increase some of the yield on the studies that we're doing. High throughput sequencing, um, I think is gonna have a big role in MF uh, and CTCL in general. Um, there is some preliminary data um, showing that it has a higher specificity than T cell gene rearrangement studies, the traditional PCR-based studies uh, with a pretty similar sensitivity. Um, I think though, you know, there's gonna be some role probably in diagnosis, but I think where it's really gonna have a role is in detecting residual disease, like patients who have either undergone stem cell transplant and we're looking to see, you know, what's going on there. Um, we have some how they're gonna do later. Another challenge in diagnosing CTCL, I said, well, it's, you know, sometimes there's just not a lot there. Our current technology doesn't pick it up very well. Um, another arena that um, can be a real challenge is when you have a lot of CD30 present, or the CD30 proliferative disorder. So, you know, for example, imagine that you're faced with this scenario where you have a biopsy with this infiltrate of lymphocytes, which are large and atypical. There's not a lot of epidermotropism, but these are definitely um, funny looking. They're positive for T cell markers, mostly CD4 predominant, and they're strongly CD30 positive. So we would put this in a CD30 lymphoproliferative disorder category with a differential diagnosis of lymphomatoid papulosis, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, either cutaneous, primocutaneous, or systemic, and then CD30 transformed mycosis fungoides. So faced with this, um, we would need to see some clinical, and in this clinical image, you see um, somebody who has some erythematous and almost necrotic with those set of dark scabs on them looking papules. And if you look closely, you can see some areas of little scars. So it looks like this has maybe been chronic. And this patient um, ends up having lymphomatoid papulosis, which um, as I alluded to before, many consider to not be a lymphoma at all. Um, patient usually occurs in younger patients. It has this rhythmical um, cadence where it can kind of come on in waves and then go away in waves. So they self-resolve after about two months and 100% survival. But um, a minority of patients who have lymphomatoid papulosis will either have a co-occurrence or um, before or after development of another lymphoma. And the most common one is mycosis fungoides. So now you can have a patient who has mycosis fungoides and the CD30 thing, it's incredibly confusing. Um, we also have this uh, group of patients, and this is reported in the literature, um, who have mycosis fungoides and Hodgkin disease or had Hodgkin disease and now they're developing lymphomatoid papulosis. So these things can come together um, and when they do co-occur. So, you know, differentiating that from this patient who has mycosis fungoides with tumors and you can tell that the tumors are erupting out of the plaques rather than lots of little dotted spots or this patient who has cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma. There's really no way to tell right now um, on biopsy. We would need to have clinical correlation to resolve those very challenging. This patient is somebody who we have who has had MF, LYP, and anaplastic large cell lymphoma. That's very difficult to resolve. So if we biopsy one of these spots, you know, what are we going to call it? Okay, um, a little diversion into um, some literature about the pathogenesis of CTCL, which I think is interesting and helps explain some of the clinical findings that we see. And I'm gonna kind of tell you two stories about this. Um, the first one is that um, CTCL is incredibly mutationally complex. 
Um, there is, turns out, no single, and this is true for many cancers, so I shouldn't, I shouldn't feel sorry for myself because of CTCL, but, but you do because it makes it a really big treatment challenge. But there's no single or even a few targetable mutations that are common to CTCL. Um, show you a little image here. This was a recent st study published where they looked at the number of somatic variants uh, or somatic mutations in patients, patches, plaques, and tumors. And um, as you go progress in disease from a patch to a tumor, the number of mutations uh, increases by fourfold. So that means by the time you're a tumor, the number of mutations you have is quite high and there's a lot of potential for diversity in there. So that's one problem. Uh, the second problem is that individual patients can carry multiple subclones. So some of that genetic variability can occur within one patient. We call it topographic genetic heterogeneity. And clinically, we kind of knew this because we might see a patient, this is a patient of mine who has patches and small papules in some areas, but then in another area has thick plaques and in yet another area, a tumor. And so the same patient has all these things um, occurring at the same time. And this was like a, just a really um, elegant paper demonstrating that. And they took um, a, few a few patients with mycosis fungoides and did basically a phylogenetic study looking at the mutations over um, different body areas in the patient and tried to like relate them to each other. And in this patient on the left, you can see that, um, and they paired uh, tumor biopsies and plaques. And so in this, the red circles are tumors and the green circles are plaques. And you can see in some patients like this uh, person on the left, um, the mutations diverge very early. Whereas in other patients, um, like the patient on the right, they diverge a little later. Um, in both of these, the blue, I guess it's only on the right, are common clones. Um, but all these other ones are very diverse. So that's messy. And um, this clinically comes up, I can provide an example of where that might be an issue. It clinically comes up uh, when we use targeted treatments, which are only going to, in theory, address one clone. So an example of a treatment that we use frequently is brintuximab vidotin, which is an anti-CD30 antibody that is conjugated to um, MMAE, which is monomethyl orostatin E. It's a tubulin inhibitor. So what happens normally with um, brintuximab, it was designed um, and initially FDA approved for Hodgkin disease, you know, because of all the CD30 expression. Um, so it's going to bind CD30, gets taken up into the cell, um, causes cells that tubulin uh, in, um, poison gets released, it causes cell cycle arrest and death. So here's an example of what that could look like in a patient with a strongly expressing CD30 disease. This is somebody who had cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma, got six cycles of brintuximab and had really dramatic clearance. And I've actually seen her since then. This is a patient of Andre Shustoff's. It's, it's totally gone, um, which is really amazing for a single therapy but she doesn't have mycosis fungoides. She has cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Here's a patient who had um, uh, Cesare syndrome with really strong CD30 expression in his skin. And he also got brentuximab. You can see his skin was sort of infiltrated looking. After brentuximab, he cleared quite a bit, but all these little BBs uh, then started to grow and proliferate and got bigger and bigger and bigger. And when we biopsied them, this little blue dots are a biopsy sign, um, they all were CD30 negative large cell transformed clones. So he had that clone before and we just selected for it by giving him a very targeted CD30 agent. So this is a challenge with this topographic heterogeneic, um, heterogeneity that we see. So some take home points um, from the talk is that MF is a lymphoma of skin homing T cells, whereas Cesare syndrome, central memory T cells. The diagnosis of CTCL, especially early MF, remains challenging. And it's probably gonna stay that way just because there isn't a lot of disease there right now. Um, clinical pathologic correlation helps, um, including photos. And thank you to Dr. Hadi and Chang and May for that. Patients can carry multiple subclones, which makes 
treatment a challenge and explains why you will often see multiple biopsies from clinicians over time because they're trying to detect some of those subclones and uh, come up with other treatment options. And that's what I have, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank, thank you, Michi, here. thank you. Yeah. Um, so much, boy, I've quadrupled my knowledge of cutaneous uh, T-cell lymphoma. So um, people who have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, and I have a question just to start off is, is there something, what, what makes a skin special as a site for uh, infiltration? Uh, do other non-keratinizing squamous epithelia, um, are they a target for CTCL? And how about glandular um, epithelia? Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. No, in general, the um, other mucosal cutaneous T-cell lymphomas do not have a tropism for other types of mucosa or other epithelium. Um, and it probably has something to do with like, you know, this combination of um, CCR and selectin expression, I imagine, um, receptor, like some combination of that, but I don't really know much about mucosal um, receptor status for some of those, but um, that's what explains why some are skin versus lymph node versus blood tropic. So it, it likely mm -hmm. explains that too. There are some types of non-MF CT cells that have tropism for, um, for different um, compartments, including mucosa, but most of them don't. Okay. And let's see, a couple of questions from chat, Mishi. Um, is uh, the disease systemic, localized, or both? And is the forming of plaques a step to advanced disease? Mm -hmm. um, so, I tell patients, so I think that CTCL is a systemic disease because when you see a patient with a plaque in one area, um, they could develop a plaque somewhere else. And how did it get from A to B? Like it has to go through the blood. And, and that makes sense because we know those effector memory T cells can go in and out of the blood, but they have a tropism for the skin. So they're sort of coming in and out. Um, so in that way, it's a systemic disease. I tell patients it is a localized disease because <laughs> nobody likes to know that it is in their blood even a little bit, um, even though we know that it's not gonna stay there. So it can be both and it probably is both, um, but in effect, it's a localized skin disease for almost all patients, unless they have blood involvement with cesarean. And is forming plaques a step to advanced disease? There is mm -hmm. data that suggests that, so in dermatology, we use language patches, plaques, tumors, patches mm -hmm. are kind of flat and not palpable with very little scale. So having patches um, is a better prognosis than having plaques, which are generally thicker. So most patients with plaques still don't progress to advanced disease. Um, but it's a little more than patients with patches. What really bumps people to advanced disease is tumors, um, that they're going to do worse. And we consider that advanced disease already. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Mishi. And then let's see another question here. Um, and I think that was when your audio went out. I know there's a moment where I couldn't hear, but. Oh, darn. The question is, can you um, talk about how you use flow cytometry? and? scenarios where flow can be useful. Yeah, it, um, thank you. The, the main time I use flow cytometry is uh, to diagnose Cesare syndrome. So doing flow cytometry of the blood because I, um, I think it's hugely helpful for that. Um, I, use, um, I use flow cytometry for diagnosing B cell lymphomas quite frequently because I think it can be really helpful for sussing out, you know, the indolent subtypes and things. Um, I have used flow cytometry for diagnosing MF and, um, and several of our um, colleagues, including Dr. Olerud had um, done some work in that arena showing that it can be helpful for picking out small clones. Um, so I have used it for that, uh, but I, I don't always that's probably the least frequent use I use of it. And I don't use it to diagnose large cell transformation because the, the big cells don't flow very well. So um, from my understanding, so I don't usually use it to help with tumors okay. of MF. Yeah. Great. And question here, any updates on the use of PUBA? Uh, 
Yeah, PUVA is Sorolin plus UVA, um, and that is a type of phototherapy that we use uh, for treating cutaneous lymphoma. And um, yeah, the update is that we still use it and love it a lot. <laughs> that um, there's actually some data that doing some treatments like phototherapy can, for some things like PUVA, actually impact the blood compartment, um, which is really curious. But um, same with total body um, radiation, that that can impact the blood compartment to a certain degree. And that makes sense if you think that when you're doing an external treatment like that, you are treating a little bit of those central memory T cells. Hmm. Um, and I see the related question, has narrowband UVB have effect efficacy? And the answer is yes, we use it a, quite a bit for cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Um, and the choice of whether you would pick one or the other very much depends on patient's skin color um, with darker skin tones, um, usually needing PUVA, which is more potent, it penetrates deeper in the skin. Um, or if someone has thicker patches, we're going to pick the more potent type of therapy. Um, Great. And then I see Eleanor Chen sent a question out. You probably see it. Any I, immunotherapy option? Yeah. yeah, there are a couple uh, promising moves in that direction. I'll say, you know, thinking about sort of the kind of mutationally complex landscape of CTCL, I was really excited about the possibility of doing something like checkpoint inhibitors. Like what we need to do is turn on their immune system and help people like fight this themselves. Um, and, and there is a long history of using immunotherapy and CTCL. People um, use interferon, um, both uh, interferon alpha and, and gamma, uh, sorry, beta, gamma. And, um, and also um, many of the other therapies that we use, uh, retinoids, phototherapy, are actually considered a little immunostimulating. They don't, they're not suppressive in any way and they do tend to activate dendritic cells. Um, same thing with um, extracorporeal photophoresis, which is a blood treatment used for Cesare syndrome. So yeah, the, I was really excited about the possibility of doing checkpoint inhibitors for cutaneous T cell lymphoma. So we actually participated in that trial when it happened a few years ago, and it turns out they're kind of a dud. Um, they work for some patients, but um, with most systemic therapies for kind of advanced CTCL, they work about 30% like just about everything works about 30% hmm. um, overall response rate. And that's what we saw for checkpoint inhibitors. So, you know, for some patients, they're a slam dunk. Why they don't work for other patients, you know, I really don't know, but I, I think it's probably going to require like checkpoint inhibitors plus, um, you know, interfere. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the tumor microenvironment and kind of waking up people's um immune systems with MF, because there's something going on that allows patients to have this for decades um, without, you know, resolving it or having it progress. Um, so a lot of what we do is try not to perturb that, to be honest. <laughs> you know, if someone has early disease, we kind of take it easy on them. Um, so we don't, we don't want to, we don't want to give them chemo because that actually might trigger progression. We don't want to give them any type of immunosuppression. Um, it's kind of a funny conversation to have with patients. Right. What What is the uh, natural history when it, when it progresses? Is the the transformation then, Mishi? Yeah. So say, you know, we counsel, I counsel patients with early disease, like patch plaque, stage 1A, that they have a less than 5 to 10% chance of progressing in their lifetime. But mm -hmm. say that they do progress, um, the most likely scenario would be that they get more extensive patches or plaques. Say they progress from their tumors. Um, sometimes patients will ask me, well, what am I going to die from? And what it typically is, is infection, sepsis. You know, they have, their skin is a really critical barrier. And um, these patients, I didn't talk about this today, but they tend to carry more staph on their skin. And so they're much more prone to staph sepsis infections. Um, so that is generally what um, gets people in trouble. Okay. And Oliver Chang has a very contemporary mm -hmm. question. Um, what are the efforts of uh, uh, AI in helping identify early MF? Yeah, um, great question, Oliver. Um, I don't know of any current efforts 
but I will say that one of our current Durham residents is working with a dermatologist at Stanford who is very interested in AI and machine learning. Um, and we have offered some of, you know, potential, since we have such a large group of photographs from the study that, that you and I did, Oliver, um, we have the, a potential data set for them to work with. So stay tuned. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, I don't see any. And of course, anyone can um, pose something by audio. But uh, if not, Mishi, thank you so much. This was just thank fabulous, as a number of people say. And a reminder, um, Brooke Emmerich will send out an email about uh, getting CME credit for this. So more thanks, Mishi. Thank you so much. Our appreciation all together. Very welcome. Okay. Signing off now, and I'll talk with you later about Alaska. That sounds all right. Good. Okay. Okay. Take care.